This is Tracy Takahama Spinoza, and this week we're going to be looking at two very big and important concepts of mindfulness and metacognition. We're going to break this down into three different pieces. First, approaching mindfulness from the perspective that Ellen Langer shared with us in our same course uh, back in 2013. We're going to integrate into that also a brief discussion of mindset from Carol Dweck's perspective. Then we're going to take a look at metacognition, look at the definitions that exist, and also talk about measuring metacognitive awareness through the metacognitive awareness inventory that um, we've shared with you in the classroom. We're going to end by talking a little bit about theory of mind, which is a strongly related concept, very distinct. From, from mindfulness or metacognition, but it does have a lot to do with the same uh, type of feedback loops that we use in our daily lives to understand others better and therefore understand ourselves better in the process. So starting with Ellen Langer's work, Professor Langer is a teacher here at Harvard University in psychology. She's done some very monumental work on mindfulness starting way back in the late 70s and 80s. And she begins with this premise that um, everything that we do in our conscious life is either done mindfully or mindlessly. And she's encouraging us to try to move towards being much more mindful in the actions that we take and in our interactions in the world around us. And she begins with this premise that we don't really know, but we think we know. So she basically starts from this premise that we oftentimes feel the need to be certain about things. We think we know, but we really don't know things. So this idea of feeling certain or assured that something is or isn't X or Y is actually a misleading way to run your life. It's not actually the most efficient way, nor is it the most self-satisfying way to approach the world because you closed yourself off to new knowledge because you're already sure that you know everything that's around you. So as Voltaire said, you know, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. So basically accepting this idea that you don't want the either extreme, right? Being, being safe and certain is as mindless as being unsafe and uncertain. This is kind of in the reckless realm of things and this is kind of just hibernating. So we're looking for this really very delicate balance in our life, which, which is to be safe yet uncertain. And that's okay. Lots of quotes related to this come from some of the, the greatest leaders we've had around. You know, the one unchangeable certainty is that nothing is unchangeable or certain. So while Langer might not have been the very first person to talk about this, she is uh, someone who sort of pushes us into this deeper reflection because she basically claims that for most of us, we're frequently in error, but rarely in doubt. So hopefully um, we can get into this stage of appreciating the fact that being uncertain is actually not a bad thing. So her, her definition of mindlessness would be an inactive state of mind characterized by reliance on distinctions. So we're looking for black and white, right? So categories that are drawn from the past means that the past overdetermines the present. So we believe that anything based on our prior knowledge, which is the way the brain works, right? Anything that we've seen before in the past will be something that recurs in the future. So we don't allow for the possibility that one trigger could lead to a different result um, from, from what we've experienced in the past. Secondly, that we are trapped into a single perspective, that we view things only as a teacher might view things, or only as a psychologist might view things, or only as a neuroscientist might view things, without entertaining multiple perspectives on different problems. Third, many people, she claims, are insensitive to context. Just because something happened one way in one context doesn't mean that in a new context that exact same action might not have a different reaction. So we have to be much more sensitive to our surroundings and to what's going on in the context of different activities or actions that occur and the distinct results that might come or due to the context. So she suggests that we're very rule and routine to governed. Becoming very mindless means that we simply look at general patterns and we presume those patterns project into the future always. That's kind of a sign of intelligence, you know, to be able to predict your future outcomes. But the problem is that by being trapped into routine, we rarely will break out of that, delve into new things or new perspectives or new ways of envisioning the world. And finally, we confuse the stability of our mindsets with the stability of underlying phenomena. So we believe that just because we are certain of something, um, we've confused that with actually what's going on in the phenomena that exists around us. And all of this is basically pointing to the habituated mind frames that exist based on what is a truly human way of learning, is that you look for patterns and you look for novelty and then you try to compare what you already know about the world and then project from there on out. There is a kind of safety in finding habituated actions. You actually do things in a habituated mind frame 
uh, if you've done them over and over and over again. And she bases this on a very interesting idea that, you know, the brain is incredibly efficient and it will do anything to save energy, right? So basically the, the brain is looking to save effort. So what it will do is try to look first for all the patterns that fit its own predictions and then base the predictions based on the patterns that it already knows or things that are already around in the world or the things that it's already experienced. And as a consequence, we fall into routines that we follow um, without even thinking about them. Certain things that we've done, maybe mindlessly, in education, for example, if you actually ask yourself things like, um, you know, why do we start school so early in the morning, or why do we have summer vacation, um, you'll find that many people have no good explanation except for to say, well, that's the way we've always done it, right? So we fall into habituated actions and we do them mindlessly. But if you actually look at the reasons or causes that um, we do have certain patterns in our daily life, and for example, in the school setting, why do we start school so early? Well, so parents can get to their work on time. And this, um, this is really problematic when you know that the brain would be better served if we started classes a little bit later in the day. Or why do we have summer vacations? Because we used to need everybody's hands on deck to help with the harvest but you know less than two percent of the American population uh, works in in farming so it, that doesn't really seem to fit the needs of today's society so we fall into these mindless habits routines that we create in our world um, without really thinking about them these become you know from individual habits to general collective habits and then there are mindless societal actions that occur so one of the ideas is can we find a way to recognize where the routines are recognize the root causes or why we actually choose to do them. And if they serve our purposes, great. And if they, or they don't really make sense, um, then we actually have to rethink those things and become more mindful. Mindfulness, then, um, as a definition, is characterized uh, by being an active state of mind characterized by novel distinction drawing. This means not only being stuck with the, um, the natural mindset of looking for the patterns that occur in the world, you know, what do I already know about something, what already looks the same as what I already do, but also enjoying and appreciating the novelty that exists in our world. So this also means being situated in the present it doesn't mean always thinking about, oh, what happened yesterday or projecting about what might happen this coming weekend, but really being centered in time. What is going on right now? Right now is the most important moment. So what is going on right now is what, where our attention should be. It also means being sensitive to context and perspective. So being mindful would be thinking about your reaction in this new context. Would that necessarily or should it necessarily be the same? Should you react the same in the context? It also means being aware of rules and the routines that guide us and to question them. You know, we fall into routines because habituated behavior is easier, it conserves energy, it's less difficult to do. But when is it that the rules that we follow or the routines that we engage in could actually not be as beneficial to us? And when should we actually think about changing those rules or those routines? Mindfulness also is a phenomenological experience of engagement. It means really being in the moment and in contact and connected with the people or the things that you are doing in that very moment. So being very, very conscious of your situation and all that surrounds you. And finally, mindfulness is noticing, uh, which is very interesting because by noticing, we reveal uncertainty. And through that uncertainty, it leads to more noticing. So when you're able to identify not only what is similar, what are the patterns around, but what are those things that are novel, um, by noticing that, we can engage more in those differences and actually appreciate them more. And through that use of mindfulness, be much more present and as a consequence, enjoy or find ourselves much more fulfilled, mindfulness, right, be fulfilled uh, within the context in which we live. So a couple of fun cartoons have to do with being mindful or mindful. And also the time aspect, you know, not just what happened yesterday or, or the problems I had or where I'm projecting I'm going to, but what is going on right now? And in a way to think about this kind of in a Zen perspective here, it's not just to look, you, you should observe. And it's not just to swallow, you need to taste your food. You shouldn't just sleep, you know, you need to enjoy the dreams that actually occur during sleep stage. You shouldn't just think, you need to feel what's going on around you. And you shouldn't just exist, you know, you shouldn't just make a living, you should actually live. So by being mindful, you actually create a lot of possibilities. But this begins with things by such as reversing your presumptions about the world. For example, people might make a statement, 
or presume. Horses don't eat meat, right? So being mindful actually suggests that you should take a new stance and just presume that everything could possibly not be what you have presumed in the past. So you make an assumption about the world that there are no presumptions about the world. And that rather than work from your own personal experience, you should actually use research as your guide. So you should be looking at, you know, the possibility that something could be true or false, and then actually determining absolutes. In the case of horses uh, eating, for example, there are some documented cases of horses, you know, chasing and eating birds and things like that. So anyways, you might presume something about the world. The idea is to suspend presumptions and that to assume that everything that we think we know is suspect and that if we actually ground our thinking more in research, looking beyond what we just presume and establishing what is known not just ourselves and not our own unique perspectives on the world, but actually looking what multiple perspectives provide through shared research, then we might be able to become a little bit closer to suspending presumptions. And this creates a lot of different possibilities. And this is connected very, very closely to the idea that um, there, you know, there are no truths in science. Um, the science of education, neuroscience, uh, psychological science, there are no truths, right? There's just evidence or lack of evidence. Um, as Nietzsche said, there's no eternal facts, as there are no absolute truths. And if you suspend these presumptions that you have about the world, then it's natural for human beings to use inference. We try to fill in the gaps that we have in our knowledge, and then we can come up with some false beliefs. So the idea is to actually uh, use research then to fill in those gaps as opposed to just basing it on our own personal presumptions about the world. Mindfulness is actually a way of connecting with your life. Uh, and it's something that uh, doesn't involve a lot of energy. It involves a kind of a cultivating attention in a particular way. So what the way I define it is it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And then I like to add sometimes, as if your life depended on it, because it does. Uh, attention is the faculty that allows us to navigate our lives in one way or another and to actually know what's happening or know that we don't know what's happening and find ways to mm, be in uh, a wiser relationship to things that are going on in our lives than than being at the mercy, say, of our own emotional reactions and crazy thoughts and uh, fears and, and so forth. So uh, it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, uh, as if your life depended on it. So paying attention to what, you might ask? Well, it doesn't actually matter. It's, paying, it's the attending itself that's important, more important than what it is that you're paying attention to. But that said, um, if you start to pay attention to how much attention we pay to anything, you begin to notice that the mind is all over the place. It never sits still. It's got this idea and that opinion and this reaction, and we spend a huge amount of time uh, planning and worrying about the future, and a huge amount of time reminiscing about the past and who did what to whom or why it worked out this way or why it didn't work out this way. And the present moment, which is the only time that we're ever alive in, the only time we could learn anything, express any kind of love or emotion, the only time we could be in our own body, the only time we can see or hear or smell or taste or touch or uh, communicate, is now. And yet the present moment gets completely squeezed out by all of our preoccupation with the future. And the future. When we start to pay attention to our own mind and our own body, it's like reclaiming your life. Mindfulness is not a technique. Uh, although there are many, many different ways to cultivate mindfulness, it's actually a way of being. Being embodied, being in some sense in equilibrium with the comings and goings of the outer world, and even the comings and goings and the ups and downs of having a body, which of course has its wonders and is also at some time seriously problematic when we're dealing with health problems of one kind or another, or uh, things that can happen to the body. And as long as we have this capacity for awareness, why not develop it? Much of the time, if you think about our educational system and how we grow up, we are trained more and more and more to get into thinking. And thinking is wonderful stuff, very powerful. Uh, some of the you know, greatest uh, achievements of humanity come out of thought uh, and out of imagination and out of creativity. But the other piece of it that's equally as powerful uh, as the capacity for thought 
is the capacity for awareness. But we get no training in awareness and attention, huge amount of training in thought. So a lot of the time when we get into bed at the end of a long day, we can't deal with our thoughts and we can't sleep. They just kind of perseverate over and over and over again. The same thoughts, we want to shut them out. The more you try to shut them out, the more they come in, and pretty soon you don't get to sleep or you wind up with a, you know, basically chronic anxiety or some kind of condition or other. Uh, depressive rumination can spiral you into uh, depression, uh, a little bit of sadness, and then that triggers this kind of perseverating constantly, what's wrong with me, why don't people like me, why didn't she look at me, whatever it is. These are all thoughts. I'm no good, I'm too old, I, you know, my life is, it's all downhill from here. All of those things, they're only thoughts, but most of the time we think of them as the truth. So what mindfulness does, in a way, is it embraces the actuality of the mind, the heart, the body, and our relationality with the outer world, and gives us new degrees of freedom to navigate the ups and the downs and the ins and outs of our relationships with life, with other people, with uh, our own aspirations and our own fears, and also, and most fundamentally, with our own body. Now, most of us don't want to go anywhere near our own body, except under very specialized circumstances at particular times. It seems like, wow, it's wonderful to have these bodily experiences. But a lot of the time, we're just pretty much up here. Thinking, thinking, thinking. And really, believing so many of these thoughts is the truth, that we wind up in a very narrow band of what's actually possible for us in terms of our human experience. To uncertainty, as we said before, and this in turn creates possibilities. So once we realize that maybe much of what we've been taught isn't so, it's easier to consider new ideas. I happen to share this perspective um, very strongly um, because there is a lot of research that shows that people who are open to new possibilities learn faster. People who suspend their presumptions about the world are actually people who learn much quicker than other people who are locked into a mindset in which they think they know everything already. She has some quotes from some, some pretty important figures, Schopenhauer, Gandhi, Edison, Einstein, who all said very similar things, you know, that we have to be able to, to suspend this initial judgment that we have. Schopenhauer said that all truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it's violently opposed. Third, it's accepted as being self-evident. And being mindful in this way is related to a type of mindset. While Ellen Langer did not uh, talk about Carol Dreck's work, um, I think it's important to maybe use her definition. A mindset is a set of beliefs or a way of thinking that determines one's behaviors, outlooks, and mental attitude. So if we said that if you can suspend your mindset or if you can allow for uncertainty to creep in where you have a tendency to want the world to be based on your own personal past experience, uh, then you're able to be more open to other types of possibilities. Uh, Langer's work is very, very close to Dweck's work in, in that she says that if we remove our negative mindsets and presumed limits, we may create all sorts of possibilities for ourselves and the people we care about. We'll prosper from being mindful virtually all of the time. So being able to suspend these negative mindsets or mindsets that might in inhibit openness to new ideas um, due to our desire for certainty, then we would be more able to, uh, to grow. And she basically divides these into two different mindsets, uh, the growth mindset or fixed mindset. In a growth mindset, you believe that you can learn anything. In a fixed mindset, you presume that you're either good at something or you're not. In a growth mindset, you believe that when you're frustrated, well, you just persevere, you just work through it. Um, but if you have a fixed mindset and you know, you're frustrated, you just give up. In a growth mindset, you want to challenge yourself. In a fixed mindset, you don't like challenge, you shirk from challenge. When you fail in a growth mindset, uh, then you learn. But if you have a fixed mindset, you fail and you think you're just no good. In a growth mindset, you tell others and yourself to try hard. But in a fixed mindset, you just say, oh, you're smart or you're not smart. In a growth mindset, if you succeed, then you can be inspired by others, other successes. But in a fixed mindset, if others succeed, then you feel threatened. In a growth mindset, your effort and attitude determine everything. So it's an attitudinally based thing. But a fixed mindset believes that your abilities determine everything. So these would be people, when we talk about the whole brain things, a fixed mindset would be people who would say, well, I just don't have the right kind of brain for this. Whereas a growth mindset might be someone like Barbara Aerosmith, who we saw last week, who uh, a couple weeks ago, who just basically decided 
she could change her brain, right? So the summary of Dweck's ideas and this fixed mindset versus growth, fixed is, you know, static. It doesn't move. Growth is always flexible and changing. A fixed mindset would be someone who avoids challenges, whereas growth embraces challenges. Fixed are people who give up easily, and growth mindset people have uh, persist in the face of obstacles. A fixed mindset sees effort as fruitless, whereas a growth mindset sees effort as necessary, and it's a basic element in learning. A fixed mindset ignores useful criticism, whereas the growth mindset thinks that any kind of evaluation is only helping them grow and become better. A fixed mindset is threatened by other people, whereas a growth mindset actually gets inspired by other people's achievements. So one of the things that we're going to be asking you to consider in this course is do you suffer in any way from fixed mindset uh, mentality? Or have you worked yourself into this place where you have a growth mindset and that you actually see uh, yourself open to new possibilities? So the conclusions from Langer's work about mindfulness is that with only subtle shifts in our thinking and our expectations, we can begin to change the ingrained behaviors, these habituated actions that we have that sap health, optimism, and vitality from our lives. So what does this mean in practice? And hopefully you guys will join the section this week that we have on mindfulness as therapy. These slides are based on the section she did back in 2014. So um, when we talk about mindfulness and we talk about how to reach mindfulness through meditation, what Julia Folkman is going to do with you in this section this coming week, uh, it's not just thinking about how not to think about things, right? We already, we have to realize in, in a mindful way that the act of intentionally not doing anything actually takes a lot of effort. So um, she's going to work with you on that during the section this week. And part of what she's going to connect this to has to do with intention networks in the brain. The attention networks in the brain uh, that were discussed in the very first class related to the recognition network, affective network, and strategic network are uh, concepts that are presented in the universal design for learning model, which will also be talked about next week. And what she will do is address some of the different formal and informal mindfulness practices. So now we want to turn to metacognition and theory of mind. This is based on a lecture that we gave in 2014, uh, which actually linked these concepts of metacognition and theory of mind through feedback. Feedback is key to learning. We need to have feedback in order to know what areas or what things need to be corrected. What's very interesting is if you look at this uh, internal feedback is actually metacognition. It's thinking about thinking. It's thinking about how to be more efficient in your own thinking. And we can look at that through neuroimaging and we can also see this through measured improvement of metacognitive abilities. But external feedback is what can be expressed as theory of mind. So understanding the other actually helps you to understand yourself. So hearing from others, um, appreciating how others view your own actions actually helps you understand yourself better as well. So we're going to look at these things kind of um, as a pair. So let's start with the idea that feedback is key to learning. Um, according to Bullish, Janet, and Bazir, there are two main avenues for learning about the self. Looking inward, as in introspection, metacognition, and looking outward, which is feedback. But both avenues have to be modeled or taught explicitly to be successful. So one thing that's very important to understand is that while your brain can't help but learn, you cannot reach levels of metacognition without explicitly working towards that goal. So if we look at this idea of metacognitive development as giving feedback to yourself, this means becoming more aware of yourself and how you actually think. So becoming more aware is not necessarily following a, a laundry list of procedures or, or this is how to think better in a metacognitive form. It's actually just becoming aware of thinking processes rather than a checklist. And the reason we say this is connected to explicit instruction is because it's actually helping students see or make thinking visible, see in themselves exactly how they think through different problems or different challenges. Cognition is the realm of thinking. Metacognition is the realm of thinking about thinking. Not thinking about the phenomenon of thought in general or the nature of knowledge in the philosophical sense, but reflecting on your own thinking process. If cognition is what happens in your mind while you're engaged in learning, metacognition is what happens in your mind when you're engaged in monitoring and managing your learning. Consider painting a self-portrait. There are two levels of activity. There's painting, the touch of the brush to the canvas. Then there's meta-painting, the painter's awareness and regulation of the painting. As the metacognitive painter reflects on his work, he draws on his knowledge of painting in several ways, an awareness of what colors complement each other, an understanding of which brush strokes produce different effects. 
and the discernment of when to apply different techniques and use certain brushes to achieve the desired result. The reflective painter also manages his own painting as he goes along. He is mindful of how he plans to use the space of the canvas. He monitors his progress to make sure he is staying on track. And he evaluates his work, constantly checking that the paint on the canvas reflects the image on his mind and in the mirror. Whether it's painting or the knowledge and skills of any other discipline, we want our students to not only be critical and creative thinkers, but also to become reflective about their learning. As students face an ever-increasing demand on their attention and an ever-broadening world available for consideration, an important part of helping them think for themselves is helping them think about their own thinking. So I'd like to ask you to reflect on this really quickly. You know, what is, you know, metacognitive practice? What do I already know? What do you know about metacognition? What are you aware of? How, what have you heard of? Uh, either in this lecture or before. And second, what's the difference between metacognition and deep thinking and higher order thinking? Okay, so having a chance to quickly reflect on this, is metacognition really the highest uh, on the cognitive scale? We have different types of models, right? And if you have um, a modified Bloom concept here, you have rem remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. And the higher order thinking here has to do with thinking about thinking. Being able to actually understand this entire process is a metacognitive structure, right? Uh, or you could look at things um, based on maybe Marzano's work. Marzano considers metacognition one of five different aspects of actually thinking in general. So metacognition is related to content area knowledge, understanding. It also has to do with critical and creative thinking, you know, innovating, being able to use this core knowledge to build off of that and to do um, something that's slightly more elevated. It's related to, but is not the same as general thinking processes, which have to do with concept formation, principle formation, comprehension, problem solving, decision making, research, composing, oral discourse. These are basic thinking processes, but that's not the same as metacognition. Metacognition would be thinking about these thinking processes. And it's also related to core thinking skills categories, so being able to focus, uh, information gathering, remembering, organizing, analyzing, generating, integrating, and evaluating. So basically Marsano is, is actually breaking apart even further um, Bloom's taxonomy that we found over here and saying that all of these different pieces are elements or dimensions of thinking. Metacognition then would be the ability to think of all these other four areas Areas at the same time to understand how one thinks best. So there are activities that have been shown to stimulate metacognition and they fall into six basic categories. So there's activities that have to do with uh, learning about yourself, knowledge about yourself as a learner and the factors that affect your own cognition. There are also other activities that have to do with awareness and management of cognition in general, uh, including strategies about how to plan, think and investigate new work. Third, there's knowledge about why and when to use a different strategy. So once you have the strategies, not all strategies are, as, uh, are good for all different types of learning. So part of metacognitive awareness is understanding which strategies work best for which kinds of thinking activities. Fourth is the identification and selection of appropriate strategies and the allocation of resources. So the energy that it takes to learn something based on the strategy that is chosen is, is really important. Some strategies require a lot of energy. Um, but they get you smaller results. Other things require less energy and get you bigger results. Other things, you know, are, are even. But you have to choose the right strategy for the different thinking activity necessary, and you have to be prepared to allocate the resources, your energy, uh, towards doing that to improve metacognitive awareness. The fifth category of activities has to do with attending to and being aware of comprehension and task performance. So basically, self-assessment. How did I do? Could I do that better? What did I do um, that could be improved upon next time? And the sixth category has to do with assessing in the process and product for one's learning and revisiting and revising. So one of the things we can do in schools very easily or with our own children is basically helping activate prior knowledge. Letting them know or helping them assess what do you already know about the new learning that's going to take place. And what gaps does that leave then? If you already know this, what are, what are the pieces that you don't know? Or is this similar to anything that you've ever learned before? So this uh, activating prior knowledge is incredibly important as a metacognitive strategy. An additional activity that's highly recommended has to do with um, habituated reflection. Always taking the time to see what you already know, what you don't know, 
and how you filled in your gaps and was that efficient or not. So taking the time to reassess and reflect about your own thinking processes um, in its own time. Many times we have um, students, yourselves, the students, sometimes you just try to cram and get as much knowledge into your head as possible, but you don't take the downtime to step away from that and to think, okay, at the end of the day, was that the best way I could have approached this learning moment? Or are there other things I could have done differently? And it's important to remember that metacognitive activities, you know, don't, while they have to be taught explicitly, this does not mean that it takes extra time. You know, you have to set a whole class time apart to actually teach it. So it actually has to do with the choice of activities that you do. And then the new habituated actions that you develop within that student so that they take the time to have habituated reflection on their own. One way to begin metacognitive awareness is to begin with four simple questions. You know, what do I already know about this? Uh, what do I need to know? So this is sort of a gap analysis. What do I already know? What am I still missing, right? Then how can I fill in my gaps of knowledge and where do I start? Those four simple questions uh, can be used in any, with any age group, with any subject matter, with any topic that you're exploring. But the idea is to come into this habituated mind frame where you're always looking at these kinds of questions as you approach challenges in your life. So some activities that stimulate metacognition uh, enhance knowledge about cognition itself, you know, how does learning occur, or they enhance monitoring of cognition. So there's those two biggies there. So one way to look at this is if you plan and you set goals about things and then there's a strategy and you monitor that, you evaluate this and then you adapt and you start all over again. A very concrete example of this, it comes from Carlton, and it basically looks at different types of strategies that can happen and then how you apply them, adapt and evaluate and modify new cognitions. So um, in their work, they uh, separate between low effort or class or activity level effort, like think pair share, very easy to do, retrieval practice, uh, what do you already know about something, right? To moderate level effort, which has to do with reflective prompts or exam wrappers or learning journals, to committed effort, things that take a lot more energy to do. When we talked about using resources, right? This takes it a lot more energy to get people to do classroom notebooks, to actually write and reflect on what they've done. But depending on the needs and depending on the strategies, depending on your overall goals that you had originally, um, this might be the best way possible. For example, in my son's class, in an you know, IV math class, the teacher had the students write reflective journals. And that journal actually helped the individual students realize what their own thinking processes were and how they were approaching the math problems. And over time, these types of journals were actually really, really helpful in helping students modify their own thinking about math problems. So depending on the level of effort, energy, and resources, and the needs that your students have based on your overall goals, you can choose different types of activities related to this. Um, I say this from a teacher perspective, but each individual, you as an individual, as you learn, can use these activities in different ways to different levels of metacognitive awareness. So this leads us to um, a visibility question or a measurability question. Um, can you see metacognition? We talk about metacognition, we're thinking about thinking, which is actually really, really philosophical. We are the only creatures on earth that can actually think about how our brains are thinking about things, right? But is that tangible? Is that something we can look at? What does that look like in practice if you're looking for observable behavior? Well, one way you could do this has to do with um, observation rubrics of metacognition. This is from a fourth grade class based on Art Costa's work related to metacognition. And rubric um, could be something as simple as uh, when they describe their own thinking, do they select the best ideas possible or they just write whatever comes to their head first? Do they give reasons for their responses that they choose? Do they articulate a plan of action? Do they plan, monitor, and adjust? They, can they self-generate questions? So basically rubrics like this can be used to identify certain sub-elements or certain aspects of metacognition or metacognitive awareness, and they can be used to help students and grow in their metacognitive awareness. There are other strategies that are listed here. They come from uh, page 166 in my book that have to do with strategies for developing metacognitive behaviors that I encourage you to look at, especially those of you who are in teaching, but also for self-awareness. If you have as a goal metacognitive awareness, do you always go through this process of identifying what you know and what you don't know? Do you talk about thinking? One of the reasons we say that one of the best ways to learn is to teach is because the individual has to express to another person using vocabulary that the other person understands or using 
or appropriate terminology to identify different concepts and terms. So this is something that we are um, that is often done uh, in writing groups, for example, um, Cambridge University, Harvard. There's many different writing groups, for example. And what do the students do? They get together. They talk to each other for about five minutes. What is it that you're going to write about? So they try to articulate what they're going to do. Then they write intensely for 45 minutes an hour, and then they talk about what happened. So talking about thinking, talking about your writing processes, talking about how you are learning about the concepts actually helps you become more efficient in your thinking. Keeping a thinking journal, as I mentioned before, the example of keeping a a journal in the math class. It doesn't seem like uh, writing things down in words would help you understand concepts in numbers, but it actually does because when you write down, well, I became really frustrated because I can never remember to put the negative sign before the parentheses. Or by actually articulating that to yourself in written form, you take it to another level of thinking. So being able to express something in a written form is a very different thing from letting things just ping pong around in your head. Planning and self-regulation. Did you actually, as we mentioned in the, the student who was preparing for a test, did you think about the best way to approach this particular test or problem? Did you plan on how you were going to divide up your time to be able to study for the different types of questions? So have you taken the time to do that? That's part of metacognition as well. Um, debriefing, the thinking process. After you've gone through that, did it work? What do you need to modify? Um, as we know, there's no two brains alike, so maybe you need to do something slightly different from your neighbor. Oftentimes we get frustrated because you think, um, you know, somebody's uh, sold you this concept that, well, if you just study in X way, you know, things will work. That doesn't always work for people. Different people have different minds. They can approach things in different ways. So you have to reassess and think to yourself, does this work for me or not? And then self-evaluation. These are guided experiences that can be introduced through individual conferences, checklists, thinking about your own processes, right? But as we said in the beginning, as far as becoming mindful of metacognition, is actually becoming aware of these different processes, but not necessarily being married to the, to the checklists that are down here, but rather to being sensitive to when you were fully present in understanding about your own new learning. So we have for you in the Canvas course room, we have the Metacognitive Awareness Inventory, which most of you have already taken, I hope. So we ask you to uh, look at these 18 different questions and to um, sort of give a thumbs up, thumbs down the, to this to actually see to what extent are you already metacognitively aware. And what we wanted to ask you is basically how did you do on that type of inventory? So if we look at the questions one by one, maybe sort of just so that we get a sense of what areas? There might be some of these that would be great for all of us to try to work on and improve, uh, or there might be some things that you personally would like to identify. But uh, if we agree that becoming metacognitively aware is a positive thing that will help us by thinking about how we think better, we will be able to learn better and consequently open ourselves to much more, many more possibilities, then it would be good if we had, were high, if we were scoring very high on this, on this inventory. But nobody's perfect, so there's going to be things that we all need to work on. So let's try to identify those. Uh, number one, I am a good judge of how well I understand something. I can motivate myself to learn what I need to. So maybe there's not something I am passionate about, but I can turn it around and say, this is great, I'm going to do this anyways, even though it was not something that was naturally on my checklist or bucket list of things that I want to get done or learn, I can actually motivate myself to learn something when I know it's good for me to do so. Three, I try to use strategies that I've worked in the past. So I know myself, I know when I learn best, and so I'm applying what I know about my past learning experiences to my new ones. Four, I know what the teacher expects me to learn. So in a class, I actually I'm aware of expectations or I understand the overall objectives. I know why I'm doing something. Five, I learn best when I already know something about the topic. This has to do with the concept of prior knowledge. Do I already know what I know about the information? Six, I draw pictures or diagrams to help me understand while learning. This means have I used multiple representations of similar concepts? Seven, I ask myself if I learned as much as I could have once I finished a task. This is really important because we know that there's this law of minimal effort. People like to do the least amount possible to get the most amount out of it. This is actually flipping it on its head and asking, did you really maximize your learning potential on this particular task? Eight, I ask myself if I've considered all options when solving a problem. So not, what is my gut reaction, you know, A, B, C, D, and then, um, then I choose, 
Um, but I realize that A is good enough and I just choose A. So have I asked myself about all the different options? Have I considered all the different options before I resolve something? Nine, I think about what I really need to learn before I begin a task. This means, again, this is very close to understanding the objectives. Do I really understand, for example, if I'm going to approach this type of a test and I know it has multiple types of problems on it, do I really know what I need to know for each of those different types of problems before I begin studying? 10. I ask myself about how well I'm learning while I'm learning something new. So in the task, while I am undertaking something, do I take the time to sort of reassess as I'm going along and ask myself, is this the best way to approach this? Is this the best way to go about this learning task? 11. I focus on the meaning and significance of new information. So do I take the time to clarify new terminology or new concepts before I launch into the learning task? 12. I learn more when I'm interested in a topic. So this is really kind of connected to number two. We know that when people are motivated, they spend more time on task and they learn more quickly than people who are not motivated, okay? So this is kind of connected. Can you make yourself be motivated for something you might not normally be motivated for? 13. I use my intellectual strengths to compensate for my weaknesses. So am I actually using what already works or what works easily for me to compensate for things that might not? Remember, we talked about attention and memory being key to learning. Well, what happens if you know that you have a problem paying attention? Well, you can extend your memory for something by writing things down, for example, or drawing diagrams. So are you able to use your intellectual strengths to compensate for those weaknesses that you might have in your learning processes? 14. I use different learning strategies depending on the situation. Remember we talked about context is really important. So different types of learning are going to require different types of strategies. So have you thought about that and have you modified the strategies for the different situations that you have? I ask myself periodically if I'm meeting my goals. Do you take the time as you are learning something to check in on yourself? How am I progressing? Am I making the progress I wanted? 16. I find myself using helpful learning strategies automatically. So do you have a wide enough repertoire of ways to approach new learning that you're able to choose with efficiency the best strategies for the best types of learning moments? 17. I asked myself if there was an easier way to do things after I finish a task. Many of us are just so happy to finish a learning task that we don't go back and revisit it. Remember we talked about the importance of taking the time to reflect. Was that the best I could have done? Is there something I could have done better? What would I do better next time to improve that? 18. I set specific goals before I begin a task. So do I take the time to plan out how I want to use my resources in the best way possible, applying a specific type of strategy because I know that that meets my needs the best in this particular learning moment? Have I taken the time to plan? Uh, we know that children as young as three exhibit metacognitive abilities when thinking about problem solving. And we also know that four and five-year-olds can actually theorize about their own thinking processes. So it's also important to remember that the development of metacognitive skills is not just something that's good for thinking about thinking, but higher metacognitive awareness benefits students in all other specific domain areas of learning. What's very interesting is that kids with high metacognitive skills tend to do well on standardized tests. But kids who only study for the tests aren't necessarily good at metacognitive skills. So it, it always pays off to, to focus on developing metacognition more than just domain area content knowledge. So I'd like to know from you really uh, quickly, thinking about yourself, how would you work to improve your own metacognitive skills? What will you do in the future to enhance your own metacognitive awareness? What is it that you personally will try to do more or better or refine in the future to enhance metacognition? Okay, now we turn to some of the evidence that exists in neuroscientific studies that have to do with metacognitive development. We know that there are studies related to cognitive control and metacognition. There's also other studies that have to do with the connection between explicit and implicit metacognition and theory of mind. Yet other studies that relate plasticity, consciousness, and metacognition. There are other studies that talk about the physiology of metacognitive awareness, so frontal lobe and decision-making and metacognition the link between metacognition and reasoning, introspective reflection, thinking about yourself, how you feel, and different brain areas that are related to that. So there's a lot of these different articles and these are available in the bundles in the classroom. You're invited to have a look at all of those. 
So big final question here, uh, is metacognition measurable? I'm making a presumption here. I presume metacognitive awareness is desirable, okay? So if it is indeed desirable, uh, is now metacognition, is it also something that's measurable? How can I tell if I'm getting better at being metacognitively aware? So the big ideas so far, um, mindfulness and metacognition. We hope that people are aware now of the definitions of being mindful and mindless and that you're hoping to opt for being more mindful in your daily fare than you are of being mindless. Uh, we connected that to different mindsets and the choice that individuals have between a fixed or a growth mindset and, and how that opens you to new opportunities, growth and learning. And we talked about metacognition itself. Um, what does it mean to give yourself feedback and its relationship to higher order cognition and activities that stimulate metacognition, uh, questions you can ask yourself, metacognitive awareness inventory and, and your scores there, the benefits of early development of metacognition and spin-off benefits in all different domain areas, and the current research in neuroscience related to metacognition. And to conclude this particular lecture, we want to talk a little bit about theory of mind. I know that we could spend an entire semester doing this as an introductory course. What we want to do is leave you with the key ideas that theory of mind has been around since the 70s. It's a concept uh, that's been recently made popular by Daniel Siegel's book and Steven Pinker's book and Pineda, Noda Frith, and Chris Frith's work on consciousness and become wildly popular over the past decade or so because of the work done by Icaboni and, and, and colleagues related to mirror neurons. Primick and Woodruff's contributions have to do with their key definition that an individual has a theory of mind if he imputes mental states to himself and others. This means that he can identify in others and himself like how you feel, how you react to things, what you think of the other. So theory of mind, in a sense, and this is what we wanted to talk about with this concept of feedback, means getting feedback from other people. Um, we know that there are tests of theory of mind for preschool children. You can use a Sally Ann false belief test that was developed by um, Uta Frith and colleagues in the UK. Play with one of your favorite activities. The water provides plenty of opportunities for learning and fun. As they grow up and take part in activities like these, one of the things that children need to be able to do is represent internally the complexity of their social worlds. This involves not just being able to predict how the world of objects works, but also how other people are likely to react in various situations. Psychologists have recently realized that in order to do this, a young child needs an idea about how people's minds work, what they have begun to call a theory of mind. And research over the last decade has suggested how this seems to appear quite rapidly and suddenly between the ages of three and four years. The great thing about theory of mind uh, is, is, a, it is a major conceptual tool that allows us to step outside of the bounds of the directly perceivable stimulus circumstances and allow for predicting and explaining other people's uh, behavior wide variety of novelties. Psychologists argue that we can see the difference between having and not having a theory of mind in simple experiments, called false belief tasks. First of all, the child has to establish the fact that their own belief is false. Then they have to put themselves inside the mind of another child in order to predict that child's beliefs. Now, Elizabeth, what do you think is inside this box? Have a look inside. Oh, well, let me have a go. Shall I? You ready? There you go. Go. What's in there? What's that? Pencils. Oh, right. Should we put them back in the box? Yeah. Should we put the lid on? Now, can you remember what's inside the box? Pencils. And what did you think was in the box? So I'm going to show this box to Jay in a minute. What will Jay think is in the box? Hmm? After you've locked up the child's tears because they expect to get sweets, you uh, ask them two questions. One is a reality question to make sure that they remember what's inside, or what's inside the box, or what's inside the box. And then you can ask them one of two false beliefs. One is uh, about their own previous belief. What did you think was inside the box? And the second question is, your friend John is going to come and look at the box in a minute. What did John think was in the box? Like that? 
Like many children of this age, when asked what another child will think, Elizabeth simply projects what she now believes herself about the tube of sweets. She doesn't recognize that the other child exists as an independent thinking being. And presented with another task of this kind, she acts in much the same way. Sally puts her marble into the basket and goes out and comes, gets the marble, puts the marble in the box. Here comes Sally, here comes Sally. Now, where will Sally look for the marble? There you go, Sally! You got it for her! Hooray! But for another child, Connor, the outcome is somewhat different. Sally comes in to find her marble. Where will Sally look for her marble? And where was the marble in the beginning? Sit. Good. So you look for the marble now. Where, where, where do you say the marble is? Have a look. Sit. Good. The joy of this procedure is that you can ask two control questions to make sure that they understand task is about. You can ask them a memory question, which is where was the object at the beginning, and of course the answer to that is at location A. And you can ask them a second reality question, which is where is the object now, which of course is location B. To be able to work out where Sally will think the marble is, Connor has to be able to simultaneously hold, or in psychological terms, mentally represent two distinct points of view in his mind. In the research studies, most three-year-olds seem unable to do this. Before the age of about four, uh, children do not use the other person's mental representations as independent entities. They do not realize that, that individuals can act upon misrepresentation. But most four-year-olds get the answers to these questions right. But why? What happens between the ages of three and four? So this is trying to see if three-year-olds, and this is so stunning to watch because three-year-olds just basically can't get it, <laughs> but a four-year-old can. So there's this huge leap of consciousness between three and four years old where a theory of mind, you know, what the other person is doing actually kicks in. So theory of mind tries to elaborate and define the individual in the context of the people in the society in which he lives. So humans have the capacity to attribute mental states to others by interpreting what others think and what others feel. So this means going from knowing the other to knowing oneself. So there are, within the same false belief task, uh, we have this situation, there's, there's a reality, you know, there's a banana, right? And the child's representation of a banana, it's really a banana, right? But when a child can go beyond that and use a meta-representation, so use the banana as a telephone, right? Um, using that part, of, this is why we, we love to see um, how children's imaginations grow, because they are able then to attribute characteristics that are not necessarily of the object to another context. And so this shows that they not only have imagination, but that they can also extend um, their own context. This also means that they can go beyond then their own head to seeing other people or other individuals. So then you have first order, second order, and third order theory of mind. So in, in the first order, you know, you have the individuals and they only think about themselves. In second order, you know, you can have a person who can think about the other person. But a third order would be that the person can think of the other person thinking of them. And when a child can reach the stage of being able to imagine how the other perceives the child himself, this allows the child then to actually self-judge based on their perceptions of what the other is viewing of them. So theory of mind, as we said before, really basically means getting feedback from other people. Theory of mind is rooted in a great deal of neurological studies that have taken place over the past decade. 
And they remind us that in order to survive, we need not only to know how to manage ourselves well, but to be aware and to respond to social expectations of others. This is why it became so popular with Daniel Goldman's book to have um, emotional intelligence. Theory of mind rests in the belief that learning is highly dependent on contact with other people and the emotions that they might be feeling and how the other is relating or reacting to the environment. This is why there exists such a thing as social contagion. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time in this course to go into it, but it's a new field that has to do with how people's brains actually get in sync based on shared experiences. A theory of mind then helps us understand ourselves better. And this self-knowledge, so theory of mind is related to self-knowledge, and self-knowledge is very much related to metacognition. Self-knowledge plays chicken or egg with a theory of mind, which suggests that in order to understand oneself, one has to understand the other. But in order to understand the other, one needs to understand oneself. So it's interesting to note that the brain studies have shown that self-assessment and self-understanding use similar neural networks as assessment of others. Uh, this is a study by Legrand and Ruby in 2009, which lends support to the theory of mind concept that we know ourselves by knowing others. So the connection there between self-assessment, self-understanding, and understanding of others is very, very tight um, and travels similar neural pathways in the brain. So as we mentioned before, uh, human beings, you know, thanks to this mindlessness that we tend to have, we presume erroneously that others uh, also have similar minds to our own, that they think like us. If we wanted to confirm that then through theory of mind, we can use four different conditions. Um, the first is joint attention. If I and the other can have the same object of attention, then we'll be close to both having mindfulness as well as theory of mind. Second is the functional use of language. If we are able to communicate and understand one another in, with similar understanding of terminology, we are now being mindful of each other's conditions as well as having theory of mind. Third, we can understand the other's emotions. As we mentioned before, related to emotional intelligence, being able to interpret the emotions of the other person and help them find the positive twists of those emotions is very indicative of theory of mind. And fourth, understanding the other's actions and their motivations for why they do things clarifies theory of mind, but it also helps us go full circle back to being mindful of the other's states of mind. So I hope it's not too presumptuous to assume that there's a big connection between all of these ideas, right? If you have a mindfulness about you as opposed to being mindless, then you would be able to well, hopefully have the right mindset, which would be a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. As we mentioned before, this leads to this openness and new learning. By adopting the right mindset, then you open yourself to the ability to be metacognitively aware and to have theory of mind. These are two feedback mechanisms that you use to learn better. So you learn how you learn better, but you also do this by understanding the other. So once you have theory of mind, then you can also have this feedback from others to actually understand your own better state of learning. So all of these things are connected in a, in a larger way. Hopefully you can see the, the big links there, even though these are all very distinct concepts that have been um, studied um, individually or in pairs, but they haven't really all been linked before in this big way. We have studies that show that the neural correlates of self-reflection, uh, which involves the anterior medial prefrontal cortex. We also have the neural correlates of story comprehension and theory of mind, which is the posterior cingulate cortex. And there's also neurocorrelates of theory of mind related to empathy. These are shared spaces in the brain as well. There are other studies related to theory of mind in the temporoparietal junction. Others that relate to personal interactions and theory of mind in the medial prefrontal cortex. And social cognition, which is related again to theory of mind. Other studies about the anterior cingulate cortex and superior temporal sulci and temporal lobes, which possibly point to these key hubs. Remember we talked about in, in week one about key areas of certain parts of the brain networks that end up being hubs because many pathways repeatedly pass through that same area of the brain. The introspection versus theory of mind studies, uh, other studies that are related to self-perspective and relationships to theory of mind, which include the right prefrontal cortex and the right temporoparietal junction and anterior cingulate cortex. Other studies that are related to the self and other judgments, uh, which includes pathways that pass with the medial prefrontal cortex. And finally, we find a lot of information about theory of mind related to attention circuits in the brain. These different areas have to do with frontal parietal network and dorsal frontal parietal network, as well as other parts of the brain related to attentional circuits um, that also take into consideration the midfrontal areas. In the classroom then, in the bundles, uh, you'll find a bundle related to theory of mind and a lot of information there in case you are interested in following up in, in this particular area of study. 
Um, if you summarize all of these different brain areas that might be related to theory of mind, it is not nearly as simple as looking at the reading brain, for example. The reading brain has, as we mentioned before, at least you know 16 neural networks, 100 something pathways. Theory of mind is much more complex and includes all of these different brain areas that have been mentioned in the studies. And, and my particular um, take on this is it's pretty much everything. <laughs> so very hard to suss out what areas of the brain are actually only related to understanding the other, understanding ourselves, a little bit more precise when we talk about metacognition because there's this self-reflection. It's a smaller loop. Uh, once we get to theory of mind, it has to do with knowing yourself and knowing the other. So it's a much broader number of pathways that are involved uh, in understanding theory of mind. Okay, so as a quick final reflection, how does this become usable knowledge? Um, what are some of the roadblocks that you might face in developing either mindfulness, metacognition, and or theory of mind? Um, these are really broad, overarching bigger ideas, as we just saw now uh, related to neuroscience. When you try to measure mindfulness, metacognition, theory of mind in the brain, it's actually uh, a lot more complex uh, than it would be to measure domain area knowledge. Um, a kid learning to add is a lot easier to document than it would be in a kid developing metacognitive awareness. So uh, is it its complexity that is a roadblock? Um, Neurotoxins, are there things in the environment um, that might uh, influence your brain's ability to make these types of connections? How about your family or other social interactions or conditions? Are they creating a risk factor in your ability to develop a more clear understanding of mindfulness, metacognition, or theory of mind? Or is it that other cognitive skills are competing you know, for your time or the general resources that you have uh, to potentiate your learning about these broader concepts. We ask you to reflect on this because when you're in university or you're studying, you know, you're oftentimes thinking of domain area or content area knowledge when it is equally or even more important to think of these broader uh, types of learning. How do you learn to be mindful? How do you learn to develop metacognition? How do you learn to maximize your understanding of theory of mind and what does that mean in your interactions with other people. And to do this, maybe one way to approach this would actually also be to understand the related concepts. What is the relationship between metacognition or self-knowledge or theory of mind or social cognition, uh, consciousness, executive functions, emotional intelligence? All of these concepts you hear every day in the popular press, but it's very hard to understand then how do they actually stack up in a hierarchical way within your brain structure? So can you find the relationship or describe a relationship between these concepts? And finally, um, yeah, there's a lot of research out there, and we've mentioned some of the studies. But in general, as we said before, there are studies about metacognition, absolutely. Metacognition, the neuroscientific basis for metacognition, yes, there are. And sometimes we cross over, right? There's studies on metacognition and self-knowledge, and there's studies on metacognition and theory of mind, and there's studies on metacognition and social cognition, and there's theories of metacognition and consciousness, or executive functions, or emotional intelligence. But what we don't have is a way to join all of these concepts in a grand theory. So for those of you looking for a good PhD thesis, good luck. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, work left to be done in documenting this information. So there's studies existing across two-dimensional visions, but there's a lack of evidence linking all of these areas. So this could be an indicator that it's a no-go and this is not worth uh, researching, or it could be just a big open door uh, inviting you uh, to, to take on the challenge of actually trying to find a link between these different areas. Okay, so what did we do today? We looked at uh, mindfulness from the theory of um, Ellen Langer's approach to the concept. We talked about mindsets and Carol Dweck's take on growth mindsets versus fixed mindsets. Then we defined metacognition and talked about its measurability, and then looked at theory of mind and how understanding oneself helps you understand the other, and through those feedback mechanisms that you receive from the outside world, you can actually understand yourself better. Okay. So as always, now we want to take some questions and we want you to do the 3 to one exercise. Please paste in this link here and do the 3 to one assignment. Three things that you did not know about mindfulness or metacognition that you now know today. Uh, two things that were so interesting that you're going to continue researching them or you're going to talk to somebody else about them. Remember we mentioned that one of the best ways to learn is to teach. So when you talk to somebody about these concepts, you're bound to learn something as well. And one thing that you will change about your personal or professional practice based on the information we shared today. Uh, again, also, as always, if there are questions that come up that you are not able to um, share or talk about uh, within the open forum right now, please shoot me an email and I will try to clarify those things before the next class. Okay, thank you very much. See you next week.